Together with AP and Amplitude, we are able to put on this, this, this evening now for the second time at SFN and to, to well, talk to you about 3Photon. Um, the first question, I guess, is why 3Photon? And it's, it's down to the fact that, that when we study the brain, we want to see deeper because the brain isn't just what's happening at the surface. And which is why 2Photon imaging has become the workhorse, basically, for modern day um, optics-based neuroscience. And 2Photon is great, as, as pretty much everyone here is aware of. You can use it to look deep into tissue. We can look at both structure and functional imaging in, in neurons. And, um, and we can get deep, right? Now, we've all seen nice images where people have very brightly expressing GFP, and we can see down to just over a millimeter. In practice, things look, look a bit different. GCAMP is, sorry, GCAMP is, is not as bright as, as GFP is. Um, and, and we hit a fundamental limit in, in the sense that at some point in depth, so this is, this is brand new data, this was acquired by Stefan Curry um, together with uh, Michelle Sanchez and, and myself in Ian Dugrid's lab um, just, just last week, or the week before last now. Um, and what we see here is that about 700 microns deep, we're in layer 5b of, of the motor cortex, and, and stuff starts looking blurry. You can still tell neurons uh, or, or recognize neurons and you can see that you can still see, see activity. Um, but you see you get this, this even smudge, this blur. And this is something Jack might be talking a bit more about later. Um, there's a fundamental limit. At some point you're turning up more and more power to get deeper and deeper. And while you're doing so, you're hitting a point where at the surface you're exciting fluorescence. And because Two photon is a, is a, is a method that's, that's optically sectioning an excitation. That means that once you do start getting surface fluorescence, um, all of that just blends into what you get um, in, in your signal that you're imaging, and you get this blur. So that combined with the fact that at some point, um, the wavelength also gets, you just have too much scattering. So you want to go to longer wavelengths, and that's where three photon comes in. And things look, look very different. Also. Fairly recent data, this is something that data we acquired um, together with Rob Lees and Adam Packer in, in, in Adam's lab um, in Oxford, um, where we have a, we've got a quite a productive collaboration with him on, on, on 3P imaging. And this is um, roughly 800, a bit over 800 microns <coughs> deep into the neocortex and sensory cortex in mouse again. These are GCAM6 expressing neurons. This is just shy of the point where the fluorescence disappears and pretty much the point at which the objective hits the head plate at the moment. So we're kind of trying to, to optimize that design to be able to go deeper. Um, but what you see here is it's, everything looks much crisper. You have, you have what looks like a blur, but if you look, you see that they're negatively stained cell bodies. So there's not some artificial background being smudged on. Well, the blur that's here is actually neuropil. There are actual structures that, that are fluorescing and the, the and, and as you can tell, you can see clearly the cell bodies, some neurites protruding from the cell bodies. You see the soma, the, the nuclei very clearly. And, and it looks substantially more different. And I suspect here the functional imaging is going to look just as wonderful as it did on in the other case. Yes, you can barely make it out. I apologize. Um, I'm happy to show anybody who wants to see this data to convince you that it does indeed show very clear activity in, in neurons. This is another example of mouse brain. Um, this is only red. These are cells expressing, these are interneurons expressing um, TD tomato, and it's a bit dimmer than it should be. This is again imaged to one millimeter depth, at which point the fluorescence disappeared. This is a part of neocortex that is not over hippocampus, so we're not going to be hitting, um, expecting to see CA1 at this point. And, and you can see that, that you've got um, um, neurons nicely spread out all the way down. There's no massive background. You can see the cells, so it's much deeper and nicer than you would expect from, from two photon imaging. And now we get to the example I was looking for, I was expecting, apologies again, um, where you have the nesting positive cells stained in, in green. You can see as you go through, you get all the way down to 200 microns into ultimately solid bone. You can still pick up green fluorescent cells. With two photon, the limit here is roughly 80 microns. So. Again, back to the initial question, why three photon? Um, to look deeper, plain, plain and simple, to look deeper, to see clearer. And um, we're quite happy that we've been able to, to move ahead on this way. And then that leads to the next question, why this evening? We think it's, um, it's a new technology.
it's a technology that, that's, that's um, while the first papers date back to 1996, it's not actually been found used in practice until about two to three years ago that it's gaining more traction. Um, there are a lot of specialist publications out there, but we felt it's, it's nice to have an evening or a, a set of talks that, that give some general background into technology. So we'll have two speakers, um, Murat Hilderim, who'll be talking about, um, among other things, photo damage limits and, um, and attenuation lengths. So a nice quantitative background to, um, to well, values that are, that are elemental to being able to do three photon imaging in, in a quantitative and proper manner. And after that, Jack Waters will give an introduction to three photon imaging in part compared with two photon, but also showing um, some of their newer results and, and just giving an indication of, of the potential that three photon imaging has as it advances and moves forward. And I'd like to ask Murat to start. Murat, um, a mechanical engineer by training, uh, studied in Ankara at the Middle Eastern uh, Technical University, or Middle East Technical University, moved on to Austin, Texas, where he learned the beauty of femtosecond lasers, mainly for use in, in surgery. I had, and uh, I had a LASIK surgery, actually, ah. so that's the turning point. Okay. <laughs> well, uh, looking at, at, at laser, femtosecond lasers in surgery, both for, for diagnostic, I believe, as well as the actual surgery procedures, and is now working at MIT in the labs of Sur and, and Peter So and has been, well, pushing three photon uh, quite a bit. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. First, I'm going to give you the most important slide, I think, in my presentation, which uh, you can see my mentors, Moganka and um, Peter. Um, I want to thank them because of providing me not only the mentorship, but also the resources, but also a lot of people uh, helping me out to perform uh, many, many projects. And specifically today, I'm going to present the work um, uh, jointly done by Hiroki and Ming, and I have a lot of people to help me out for different things such as K99. And our uh, funding resources, NIH, NSF, Mass Life Center, Picard Institute, and also I want to thank NIH director actually highlighting my work in March. Um, so let's go through the outline. First I'm going to tell you a little bit about myself, um, because I'm not a neuroscientist, I'm trying to be a neuroengineer. Um, and then I'm going to tell you about how you can develop a 3-photon microscopy in your lab if you're interested in. And then I'm going to show you two stories about the three-photon microscopy right now happening in our lab. Okay, um, I got my mechanical engineering degrees, both uh, undergrad and master, from Mid Middle East Technical University um, uh, in the uh, Ankara, the capital city of Turkey. And this is again a turning point in my career that where in my master degree I developed a fiber optic interferometer to measure very tiny micron level clearances in piston cylinder mechanisms, which is a very uh, hardcore mechanical engineering problem. Then I had the LASIK surgery, and it was really day and night difference in my life. And then I really searched who are doing femtosecond laser surgery stuff in the in research basis. And then I found Adela in uh, UT Austin. And then she also has a very, very similar career like me, that hardcore mechanical engineer in Stanford, and then worked with Eric Mazur, um, and then find some kind of a C. elegans application of femtosecond lasers to study neurodegenerative diseases, and actually then she actually forms uh, her lab in UT Austin. We have two big projects, but one of them is actually developing uh, tabletop and endoscopic tools to uh, perform nonlinear imaging uh, assisted uh, microsurgery. Uh, our goal was eventually bring this technology into, into the clinic for clinical problems. And at MIT, um, I would like to really combine these technologies uh, because at that time the brain initiative was initiated. Um, and then uh, our goal was again to study the study and function of the brain of different biological systems with using multiphoton imaging. Okay, so uh, let's start with a very, very brief um, overview. I know that Jack will give uh, maybe um, a bigger um, kind of picture, but our goal is actually to perform deep tissue imaging, specifically in this um, kind of case, brain imaging. And we know that. People have been doing a lot of brain imaging and other tissue imaging with using single photon and two photon. And main difference is that when you look at the sample, the emission intensity is proportional to the excitation intensity linearly in single photon. However, in two photon, it is actually proportional to the score of excitation. This is maybe not very, you know, kind of um, a good explanation. If you go to the practical things, you can see from the Zipfeld's paper maybe uh, two decades ago, uh, they shine the sample uh, with blue light and you can see the emission is all over the place, including focal plane. But if you shine it with 960, they can see very nice two-photon focal uh, plane um, kind of emission. And then when you look at the tissue constituents in terms of their absorption uh, lengths, 
or absorption uh, kind of coefficients, water, oxy and deoxy, hemoglobin and melanin, you can see that we have a very nice window to do two photon imaging, which is maybe starts from 700 to maybe 1300, so that it's a very good actually motivation to do two photon imaging in tissue. Uh, and then in uh, neuroscience also people are very, very, um, you know, amazed by the capability of two-photon imaging. And this is just an example from Moganka's lab two, two three years ago. Uh, Mike and Gerald published a paper looking at multiple areas of imaging serially. And you can see here um, that they can perform multiple imaging, which I need to I think, click some way. Yeah, so they can record thousands of neurons um, in layer 2, 3, and they have actually very nicely uh, correlated the activity with respect to animals' behavior. Very simple go and non-go test. Uh, but we would like to go deeper because um, even though in neuroscience many, many years people are actually having theories about the recordings of layer 2, 3, but they're assuming that the deep layer is happening the similar stuff. But when we started to have an access to deep layers, we understand that they are not doing the same thing with uh, superficial layers. Um, so, before going to three photon, I would like to show you a paper that actually in my PhD lab we published many, many years ago, in which actually we are trying to show why two photon imaging is limited to deep, uh, when you want to do the deep tissue imaging, because of the fact that when you try to image a very deep layers, then you start to have a lot of background fluorescence happening in the surface, which actually kind of ki kills your signal and your signal to noise ratio becomes very low. And we do actually uh, analytical uh, computational and experimental analysis um, of uh, like typical tissues in which their scattering length is varying from 30 micron to 200 micron and on the y-axis you can see the maximum imaging depth is normalized by the scattering length of that tissue. So if you think about epithelial tissues, uh, for example your um, tongue, it's a scattering length on the order of 80 to 100 micron and depending on how your uh, fluorophore is concentrated you can image maybe 3 to 5 scattering length. Which is, which is, I think, um, you know, ob observed and also uh, confirmed with experimental results. If you think about the brain with imaging 900, you know, 920 wavelength, you can see that the, the, the scattering length is on the order of 100 to 150 micron. So you can go three to, again, five, six um, scattering length. But what does it mean? So you can see here a parameter kappa, which means that if kappa is very high, your chlorophore is only concentrated on the focal plane. You can think about you have a vial injection to only just very, very tiny volume, or you have a Cre line that only expressing the GCAM in layer five or layer four or layer six, like an NTSR animal. But if you think about the kappa is very low, it means that you have a transgenic animal that GCAM is expressed all layers, or you have a huge chunk of uh, vial injection to the whole layers. So uh, since this is the limitation, of course, what is the Solution, how can we actually go deep? Three photon, of course, improve the imaging depth, okay? Um, because we know from Chris Hughes' works that um, there are um, automatically very uh, kind of um, uh, monotonous increase in the scattering length, which is in here in the red. And we know that absorption has a very weird kind of uh, properties. If you go to 800, 900, you can neglect it. But if you go to 1300 or more, you can see that there's a dip, which shows that there's a huge absorption and then it's go up and then down again. So 1300 and 1700 is experimentally and theoretically shown that it's kind of a sweet spot. Uh, but it's not enough. Uh, if you want to, for example, record in hippocampus, let's say, or subcortical regions, um, you need to uh, send the beam to approximately more than one millimeter. And you can see that with two photon, you have a lot of maybe four or five orders of magnitude more uh, surface or out of focus signal, which actually kills your uh, imaging capability. And this is not the only story. If you think about the lasers that you want to pick, if this is a typical two photon laser, which is 80 megahertz at, let's say, 100 frames per second pulse width, which uh, automatically makes your duty cycle, which is the multiplication of these two parameters, 10 to the minus 5. But if you think about the three photon to have the similar signal quality, you need to reduce this multiplication by two orders of magnitude. Since you cannot easily do uh, reduce your pulse width from 100 femtosecond to 1 femtosecond. The easiest way is you can reduce your uh, repetition rate from 80 megahertz to 1 megahertz or 2 megahertz so that you can increase your pulse energy per pulse and you can get similar signal in superficial layers with people show. Plus the probes, as you know, the GCAM is very popular because of brightness, sensitivity, and uh, generally people characterize it and find out that 1320 is the peak. However, when you do the experiments, actually, we also show that, and there are, uh, there's another paper from Chris Hugh group 
that actually thirteen hundred is better in terms of getting the signal from the tissue. Uh, okay, with this introduction, I think I can just start to tell you the first story. Um, we have two questions. First, how does the individual layer of primary visual cortex in mice, in awake mice, contribute to processing low-level visual information? And the second one, how do we perform damage-free imaging so that there is no adverse effect on cell physiology? So for that, um, I developed a system from scratch. Uh, at that time, we only have the um, SPRIT, uh, which is spectrophysic right now, MKS, I think. So we kind of um, purchased the laser, and then I developed the rest of the optics, maybe a couple of months, to make sure that we have actually the best conditions, close to the best conditions on the sample. Uh, as well as we uh, getting very, uh, I, I believe, maximum, close to maximum signal in the PMT so that we put very minimal power in the brain and we can get very good signal. To start this analysis, actually, I did, did a little bit inverse engineering because most of the people start from the, you know, the chirp line, the delay line, pulse chirper, and then other stuff. But I start from the objective because in, our, in my PhD, we did this a, a, a lot to do some endoscopic um, you know, um, kind of systems. So um, in ZMAX, this is just ZMAX analysis of the very similar objective like um, uh, Olympus has. Uh, it's a water immersion. The working distance is two millimeter, and you have a 15 millimeter uh, back aperture. And I tested a couple of parameters with our scanning uh, conditions, and we can get a very good focusing conditions. And this is published in Nature Communications in, this, in the beginning of this year. Then uh, we learned that from this um, exercise, designing and implementing the optical elements increase the performance of the custom-made mi microscope. Because if you just purchase off-the-shelf lenses, you may not really, really reach the best conditions easily, so you need to go back and forth in your design. Um, so um, then we need to um, design the excitation and emission optics. This is just the excitation with one uh, scanning lens, including the objective that I showed in the previous one. Then we kind of characterize the many, many parameters, as well as the emission. And then also for the emission, we look at a couple of other options that if we put one inch lens versus two inch lens, how we can get the light on the PMT. And we conclude that two inch lenses is better. But when we uh, submit the paper, uh, reviewers would like to see in uh, reality. And I don't, I don't think anyone else shows in experiments in one millimeter deep brain what's going on if you change this uh, emission conditions or uh, like collection, uh, collection conditions. And we show very nicely here from left and right, this is one inch, this is two inch. We are actually increasing the signal approximately two times. And we did also point spread function analysis and collection analysis also. Um, this is just the point spread function in 3D. So two, two micron Z and half a micron in uh, lateral direction, which is effective NA of 0.9 in three photon. And we did also pollen grain and small tiny bead imaging. Okay, so uh, since I really love doing surgeries, microsurgeries, I also started to do in the brain. And the reason is that we can actually uh, really, really uh, characterize the attenuation length, which is combination of ex uh, scattering and absorption in the cortex and the white matter. So we kind of get some numbers for the visual, uh, visual primary visual cortex by ablating four different depths in different energies you can see here. Um, this is uh, the, the, the characterization obtained with THG imaging. Some of you know, but maybe some of you don't know, THG is a third harmonic generation imaging that can allow to image blood vessels in the cortex because of the high absorption peak of the hemoglobin at 430. Um, so we can excite with three photon. But in the white matter, because of the myelin sheets and they have a huge lipid bodies or lipid kind of concentration, you can also see very nice white matter myelin sheets or axon tracts. So we can characterize with TH imaging and with ablation, we can confirm that they are actually 10% off between each other. Okay, and then we do the visual stimulus because we know that um, mice, uh, uh, two neurons next to each other have uh, kind of a total different orientation selectivity, uh, which is different than macaques or you know human. Um, with this kind of a salt and paper stuff. Then we characterize it in terms of the, what is the orientation selectivity, direction selectivity for uh, starting from layer one to layer six and also neurons in the white matter. Uh, I'm just skipping because I think this is very um, uh, easy, easy and typical stuff for neuroscientists. Then, um, before going into detail about our, about, about our analysis, we would like to see actually what is the effect of pulse energy on the cell's physiology. For that, you can see here, I actually put a lot of energy, which is the last case, of course, very extraordinary case that more than 10 nanojoules on the focal plane per each a layer, and you can see that after maybe 10 to 20 seconds, we burn the tissue uh, because of the optical breakdown. 
And if we use a little bit less energy, we can see some saturation of the fluorophore G chem success. And if we use a little bit less, we have two conditions that we don't see any difference visually. And as you know, most of the papers in two photon and three photon, they generally commented in their discussion section that, okay, you know, we apply this power and then we don't see any damage or maybe they can just uh, sack the animal and then do some histopathology using glia or other kind of CFOS kind of thing. I think it is enough uh, for just showing that there is not damage after a couple of hours or etc. But if you want to really say what's going on in vivo, I think you should have some kind of other metrics. So that's the reason that we uh, recorded each neuronal activity while we are representing the visual stimulus to these animals for 12 different uh, interactions and then 10 different um, uh, trials, so it's kind of randomized. And then we kind of trying to analyze whether the cell's responses are changing while we are changing the uh, or increasing the pulse energy. Now you're going to see them for each layer. Just first, I'm, I'm going to show you one cell in layer 2, 3, this lower energy and higher energy. You can see that actually uh, in the lower energy, even though preferred orientation is this one, in higher energy it's actually changing, especially the intensity, average intensity is changing. In layer four, you can see similar stuff, but this time uh, the orientation uh, preference is changing from this guy to this guy. Layer five, layer six, it goes like that. So we are seeing that we need to do more analysis, not just looking at the one cell. And then when we do the population analysis, now you can see that the preferred orientation, which is the blue line, shows that in these two conditions, low energy and high energy, if the cells are in between these two lines, they are actually kind of preserving their preferred orientation, which is most of them, like 70% of them. Then we focus on the 70% of the cells and then now look at the average delta of, F, delta of F values. And now you can see the blue line again shows us that they are actually having the similar delta of over F if they are between these two lines. And as you can see this time, both layer two, three, layer four, layer five, layer six, and one manner, they are actually biased to more in the first energy group, which is lower. So at the end of the day, after doing this for three animals, we are seeing that 70% of the cells in blue on up preserving their uh, preferred orientation. When we focus these cells, now we can see that the green is dominating, which is the first energy group having more delta of error compared to the second energy group. So it is just shows that if you use in our experimental conditions less than two nanojoules per pulse, uh, on the focal plane, then actually it is safe for physiological condition of the neurons. Then we do the all layers, uh, every 100 micron we got it, uh, got the neuronal responses, the magenta is blood vessels, and then we actually characterize their orientation selectivity. And then after we sack the animal, uh, sorry, before we sack the animal, since we created some ablation spots, we can easily find the layers corresponding to our experimental uh, measurements without using any Cree animal. It's just the same animal. You can record all the layers. And then uh, for the population analysis, we have five animals. And you can see that uh, orientation selectivity, global, local, and directional selectivity values are actually similar in between animals. And when we focus on the layer five, for example, uh, the layer five values are smaller than the other one. And layer six is a little bit higher. But of course, um, in layer six and layer five is very uh, right now attractive because when you think about their input and output, they are actually having very, very different uh, visual selectivity, um, either cortical, cortical, or cortical thalamic. Okay, so um, the most interesting result that we got actually in the white matter, every animal very consistently, we are seeing some neurons in between the axonal tracts, open positions, and you can see that their visual responses are a little bit poorer compared to their counterparts in the um, in the uh, visual cortical layers. However, they are, they are actually active. So in the literature, it was not very actually clear to me and my colleagues in the lab that uh, people studying the, these kind of neurons, like we can call subplates, someone called layer seven, someone called layer six B, uh, are actually you know, existing or even they are active or not. We, are sh we show for the first time that they are active. They are kind of responsive to the visual stimulus, but not uh, very responsive to their counterparts. And right now we are actually doing experiments to understand what condition they are actually responsive more than this kind of sim simple visual stimulus. Okay, so these guys are important because these subplate neurons are earliest born neurons and they are, they are largest uh, maybe transient neurons for development of cortical connection and circuits, but they have been implicated recently many, many brain disorders. So I think it's important to study them in not only the developmental stages, but also adult stage. Okay, so, Conclusion, we just characterized that um, 
we have um, uh, the local and global orientation selectivity and direction selectivity values are actually subplate ones are lower and then we have different kind of conditions but layer 5 come next layer 6 is higher but sometimes layer 2, 3 and layer 4 is equal sometimes layer 2, 3 and layer 6 equal but most importantly if you have more than sorry less than 3 knowledge of pulse then it's safe but if you go higher depending on your experimental setup it may be safe or it may be not safe um, so this is kind of the uh, conclusion of the first study. Second one is very simple uh, and it's on the bioarchive right now. Uh, so in this one we are actually interested in right now different visual areas, not only primary but also higher visual areas and we want to actually understand whether there's any connect, uh, kind of correlation between structure and function of these visual areas and if yes then how can we do it in vivo. So for that um, we just do um, as um, uh, uh, Jack sh uh, showed a couple of years ago in Eli paper a uh, transgenic animal and then showed uh, the visual stimulus uh, com somehow coming from right to left and up and down and then we find very nicely the boundaries of the V1 and other five higher visual areas and then we bring this animal in three photon system and then using this blood vessel architecture we can find each region and then do right now columnar imaging. Now you can see just simple how the brain regions are getting active when you move the stimulus right left or left to right or on the right hand side you can see how these brain regions are getting active when the stimulus is going up and down or top and uh, bottom up. Okay. Then uh, as I told you we did some columnar imaging for each region and then we characterized their attenuation lengths just using a THG signal uh, and we did for four animals and you can see that we can get some kind of a trend. At the beginning, we don't understand what is the trend, uh, but when I look at the um, papers of uh, retinotopic mapping, then I realize that in the retinotopic mapping, people actually uh, demarcate these regions as a, a sign map. So they have the sign for V1, let's say, negative, and then next region, let's say, in the uh, counterclockwise direction, uh, in the medial region, let's say, uh, um, PM, then it's um, automatically positive, and then AM is negative, and it goes like that. So now there's a zigzagging plus and minus kind of, uh, uh, kind of a distribution. And when you look at the cortex and white matter, and even cortex and white matter, we are seeing very similar zigzagging pattern. But of course, we don't know whether they are significantly different or not. Um, just to confirm that what we are getting with THG for V1 and other regions, making sure uh, that it is actually meaningful data, we did also ablation. And we can actually find that all these six regions, what we find with THG is uh, 15 to 20 percent less than what we are getting with ablation. Ablation is kind of a grand truth for us because we are not limited by the uh, emission wavelength just using the excitation wavelength. We can ablate and then characterize how much we ablate the tissue. Then for the significance analysis we do actually look at the attenuation length in cortex, white matter and cortex and white matter and you can see on the right hand side how significant dif different from they are. Uh, just to make the whole story short, you can see this diagonal and if you look at the right and left hand side, you can see whether any region next to each other are significantly different from each other and you can see that all regions except AM and PM here, they are significantly different for cortex. When you look at the white matter, they are all significantly different from each other and when you combine cortex and white matter, you can see again except AM and PM, even we have a similar trend but uh, this is the only, I think, um, uh, uh, point that not follow the trend. Um, and interestingly, when we look at the uh, white matter attenuation length and cortex attenuation length on the same plot, this is kind of a sign map that uh, blue regions have the minus and the red regions are the uh, plus sign. You can see that we can have a kind of a classification or grouping of these regions when we compare their cortex and white matter. The only uh, region that is actually in between these two regions are V1, which is I think acceptable because V1, depending on where, where you are recording here or here, you may expect, expect that it may actually get close to the uh, red regions. Okay, so finally to understand why we have this kind of correlation map, we did also cytoarchitecture analysis where we look at the each region and then find out their cell size and cell density and then fit into a numerical algorithm to actually estimate their extinction or attenuation length. As you can see, our model and also experimental uh, results are matching very well with each other, which shows us that maybe one of the reasons that we are seeing this kind of correlation is the cytoarchitecture. And then we also look at the myelar architecture and uh, blood vessel architecture because we have this data in vivo with TH imaging. And you can see here in B, we, we compare the blood vessel orientation. Uh, and you can see that the four regions, which are V1, LM, AL, and RL sharing, uh, 
their orientation about and AM and PM also share with each other, but they are significantly different from these two groups. When we look at the mild architecture in the white matter, now we are seeing that only plus uh, uh, in the sign map plus um, regions have the similar orientation and negative signs also have the similar orientation, but in these two groups we have significantly different results. Uh, yeah, this is, I think, for me. I think I'm looking for <laughs> faculty <laughs> positions, okay? Uh, and this is the final, I think, thing. Uh, if your institute or your department is interested in people like me, let me know in the social. Uh, and if you have any questions, I'm very glad to answer. Well, thank you, Christian and Beth and Scientifica for the, the introduction. Um, <coughs> yes, so... Um, oh, before Right, so before I start, uh, I should just point out that nearly all of the, the work that I'm going to show you today was the, the work of one very talented postdoc, Kevin Takasaki, uh, aided and abetted by a, a sort of a, a group of, of people from, from the Allen Institute and beyond. So, um, so when somebody says multi-photon excitation to most of us, I think we think of this situation here. So a situation where we get some, some intrinsic optical sectioning as a result of the, the, the nonlinear uh, uh, excitation of a fluorophore um, so this is, this is, in fact, two-photon microscopy. And I, I think what we tend to conveniently forget is that there's, there's a significant or a finite probability of, of excitation above and below the focal plane. Um, now, this is, um, this is something that really becomes problematic under some conditions. And this is something we've known for, for very many years. So this is some old work from, from Patrick Tier and Winfried Denk. Um, so these are, these are fluorescent side projections. Uh, this one is fluorescent beads in agarose. This one is blood vessels labeled with, uh, with dextran in vivo. And this is a, a thigh one GFP mouse. And in each of these cases, then, the, the, the image quality, the contrast particularly, looks, looks very good in superficial locations. But in these, in these very deep locations here, you can see we, we lose contrast and there's significant fluorescence. Um, <coughs> so what's happening here is, as Christian uh, 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 um, mentioned earlier, is that um, as, as one focuses deeper and deeper into tissue, uh, the, the intensity at the focal plane declines due to scattering, and the experimenter simply turns up the illumination intensity to try and compensate, to try and maintain the, the intensity in the focus. And as one focuses very deep then, the intensity in the, uh, in the more superficial aspect of the tissue becomes quite high, and it can become high enough that it drives fluorescence from these, from these superficial fluorophores. Of course, in two-photon microscopy, we, we make the assumption that all the fluorescence comes from the focal point. So when your focal point is down here, even though you're generating fluorescence from these superficial fluorophores, it's misassigned to these, these deep locations. So it gives us this, this appearance of a very bright fluorescence in, the, in these deep locations. So this is a problem, particularly with two-photon microscopy. Uh, we, can, we can sort of model this numerically. Um, and so if we plot the, the fluorescence as a function of depth here, this is with the focal plane at 200 microns, you can see the, the fluorescence is, is nicely isolated to that 200 micron optical section. Um, the problem then is as we focus deeper, so this is to 400, 600, and 800 microns, you see this sort of nasty hump of out of focus fluorescence that kicks up. So this is fluorescence from, from fluorophores above the plane of focus, which of course will just sum with the fluorescence we're generating from the focal plane. And this is what gives us this, this loss of contrast and this high fluorescence deep in the tissue. So how do we get around this problem? Well, needless to say, we go to a non, more nonlinear form of microscopy. So this is now a uh, three photon excitation. You can see we've, we've changed our scale here to kind of highlight the fact that there is just a tiny bit of out of focus fluorescence with three photon microscopy, but really it's, it's kind of negligible. So this really is, is the big advantage of three-photon microscopy. Um, this, is, this is the secret. This is what allows us to see so much deeper with three-photon microscopy than with two-photon microscopy. And this is what's allowed people like Chris Zhu over at Cornell and, and uh, the Vaziri lab at, at Rockefeller to image down into to deeper structures like hippocampus through, through intact cortex. So, so this reduction in scattering and the, uh, and the resulting um, reduction in out-of-focus fluorescence is is really what allows us to see deeper um, with three photon microscopy. But it's a bit more than that. We don't just see deeper, we see, we see actually clearer, as I hope to sort of explain in just a moment. So, so how have, I thought it, probably the, the best thing for me to do was to tell you how we've sort of used this facility in, in our experiments. 
So the, the main way in which we've used three-photon microscopy, or the main project in which we've used three-photon microscopy to date, is a combined functional imaging and electron microscopy study. So this is a study in which um, Nuno da Costa and, and Clay Reed wanted to, to reconstruct an entire cortical column uh, in the mouse. So this is a, um, a volume one by one by one millimeter, or thereabouts. And their aim was to, was to reconstruct this with serial section electron microscopy. Um, so this is, of course, a, a, an obscenely large volume to try and reconstruct by electron microscopy. Uh, it's somewhere in the region of 25,000 sections, or about 100,000 neurons. Um, and this has been a, a multi-year effort. It's been very expensive in terms of both time and, and money. And naturally, if you're going to, to reconstruct a very large volume like this, you really want to know as much as possible about the tissue you're reconstructing. Specifically, you want to know about the functional tuning properties, ideally of, of all the neurons in that volume, before you, before you process it for electron microscopy. <coughs> so, uh, you know, reconstructing this very large volume was certainly an electron microscopy challenge, but it's also a functional imaging challenge to try and characterize all of these cells first. So how do we go about doing that? Well, the first thing, of course, we need is we need uh, labeling all of those cells in order to be able to, to measure their activity. That's um, relatively straightforward with some of the new mouse lines we have available. So uh, we've tended to focus on excitatory neurons. So we've used an excitatory Cree line, SLC17A7, and crossed it with this AI162 reporter line. So this is one of these new Tiger 2 reporter lines that drives very strong G-camp expression uh, in the presence of Cree. So these, uh, these reporter lines allow us to, to label essentially all of the excitatory neurons within, within the volume, certainly within most of cortex, in fact. The, uh, <coughs> that, that's something of a double-edged sword. Obviously, it's necessary for our experiments, but it also throws up a problem in that this out-of-focus fluorescence with two-photon excitation kind of comes back to kill you. So when you have very dense expression, um, you see this, this loss of contrast in the two photon images at quite a superficial location. So this is now two, three, 400 microns. And you can probably start to see the contrast is already starting to decline at 400 microns. So we're really only halfway through cortex and we're starting to have a, a sort of a contrast problem. And so for us, the big advantage of three photon microscopy isn't really so much that we can see deeper. You know, we can see to the, the bottom of, 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 of cortex with two photon microscopes. The big advantage is that we maintain our contrast throughout that depth um, and that simply makes the, the measurement of the functional properties down in these deeper layers uh, much simpler. So for, for our project, what we, what we really needed to know was at what depth the out-of-focus fluorescence becomes so problematic that it impairs measurement of the tuning properties um, that we would normally measure with two-photon excitation. So how do, we, how do we assess that? How do we know when our tuning properties um, uh, are inaccurately measured with two-photon microscopy. Well, obviously, what we need to do is to, to compare as directly as we can the uh, tuning properties measured with two- and three-photon microscopy. And the most direct measurement we can come up with is a, is a near-simultaneous two-photon, three-photon excitation process. So for our experiments, we simply put two lasers on the same table, one producing 910 nanometer excitation for two-photon excitation, another 1300 line for, for three photon excitation. We place a pockel cell on each of these two lines, some conditioning optics, and we feed the two lines into our microscope. And then we use these two pockel cells essentially as very fast shutters. <coughs> so we simply toggle between the two and three photon lasers, um, and we, we alternate between them line by line. So we gather a line of two photon data, a line of three photon data, two photon, three photon, and we, and we alternate backwards and forwards. Our line time is about half a millisecond. <coughs> so so in, on the time scale of a, of a calcium indicator, this is pretty close to simultaneous imaging with two and three photon. And then, of course, we, we separate the, uh, the lines uh, offline to give us two separate images, a two photon image and a three photon image, which were acquired nearly simultaneously. So the result then is, is paired images. So we have a two and a three photon image from the same depth. And I think you can see the, the same field of neurons there. Um, and we have, uh, these, these are just examples at 250, at 450, and at 650 microns. And the number of things you can see here. So firstly, you can see that declining contrast in the two photon, but not the three photon images with depth. Um, the other thing you may notice here is we're actually using less laser power for the, uh, for the three photon images than the two photon images. 
something I think we're often asked is, is whether three photon excitation uses so much power that you necessarily do damage and phototoxicity. And the answer is no. Actually, commonly, you can use less illumination than you might with, with two photon microscopy. The third thing you may notice here is that, particularly down at, down at 650, you actually lose visibility of, of most of the neurons. So the very brightest neuron, you'll occasionally see flash in the middle here. But, um, but in the extreme case, then, you, you really can't, you can't resolve these, these neurons in the two-photon image, um, much less measure their functional properties. So to give you a slightly more quantitative view of those measurements, then, so these are two and three photon traces from a single neuron here at 350 microns. Um, and we're, we're here, um, we're, we're stimulating, stimulating the neuron with drifting gratings in 12 different directions. Each line here is a, is a single trial, and the, the, the darker line is the, the mean. The gray bars are the, 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 the stimulus presentation period here. <clears throat> and so the first thing that always strikes me when I look at these images is just how remarkably similar the two and three photon images really are. The, uh, the traces really follow each other, um, you know, frame by frame. And so the result is that the, the correlation coefficient in these superficial locations, up to about 400 microns, is really very, very high. It's around about 0.8 or perhaps a little higher. So in superficial locations, two and three photon imaging really gives us the same answer, and it gives us identical tuning curves for this, for this neuron. To give you an example of a neuron in a deeper location then, here at 500 microns, you can see the neuron is, is clearly tuned with three photon microscopy. We can see responses to some of these directions. And we can see that a directional tuning curve for the neuron. But under two photon conditions, really, we, we can't even observe responses to these different drifting gratings. So for many of the neurons uh, in, these, in these deeper locations, we can, we can get a weak signal. We can measure, a, um, uh, measure the directional tuning. But that directional tuning is, is somewhat unreliable. And the correlation uh, declines quite uh, abruptly from about 400, 450 microns into deeper locations. So I can show you that data in a slightly different way here. So this is the, uh, the preferred direction under two photon excitation and under three photon excitation. And obviously cells which have the, the, same, the same direction preference um, in those two modalities will, will lie along the, along the diagonal here. So most in the, in the superficial locations, almost all the cells pile up along this diagonal. And then if you look into these deeper locations, the, uh, the two photon direction preference tuning becomes somewhat randomized, and the cells fall off that diagonal into sort of random locations. And again, this, this, this roll off, the match in neurons, seems to occur at around about 400 or 450 microns. OK, so what's going on here? Well, obviously, we'd like to think that this is the result of out-of-focus fluorescence. Um, the difficulty is that, is, it, is that no one previously has really been able to, to separate in-focus and out-of-focus fluorescence to say at which depth that out-of-focus fluorescence really becomes problematic. So we can make some predictions here from our numerical models, but what we really want to do is, is to, to measure those two. Now, the good news is that with simultaneous two and three photon excitation, we can, we can get an estimate of the in and out-of-focus fluorescence. So if we simply make the assumption that the uh, that three photon excitation drives no out-of-focus fluorescence, which is kind of close to true, then, um, then if, we, if we compare the contrast between two and three photon excitation, then we can, then we can, um, we can assume that any loss of contrast is due to out-of-focus fluorescence. And we can simply use the contrast ratio between two and three photon as a measure of the percentage um, fluorescence which comes from inside and outside the focal plane. So we can estimate the, the percentage fluorescence from inside the focal plane and plot that as a function of, of depth here. And you see that, the, uh, that the, 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 the fluorescence is largely from within the focal plane down to about 400 microns, maybe 450. Beyond that point, the, the fluorescence, most of it, in fact, arises from outside the focal plane. Um, so it really does seem to be at around about this point where the, the out-of-focus fluorescence becomes dominant, that two-photon fluorescence becomes unreliable uh, as, a, as a measure of, of tuning properties. Um, just for the completeness, of course, we can, we can plot this curve for three-photon microscopy. I don't think this is a great way to, uh, to, to sort of estimate the, uh, the out-of-focus fluorescence in three-photon microscopy. But I put this here just to sort of make the point that we expect the out-of-focus fluorescence in three-photon microscopy to become significant at, at very deep locations, perhaps two millimeters or more. 
So I don't think two out-of-focus fluorescence is, is likely to be limiting in the three-photon case. Okay, so what does this mean for our, our functional imaging and EM experiments? Well, these are data from one mouse where we've, uh, where we've imaged the, the, the entire cortical column. Um, each little white dot here is a soma location uh, measured with two photon microscopy and each little pink dot is a soma location measured with three photon microscopy. And you can see what we've done is we've, we've measured um, tuning properties with two photon microscopy down to about 550 microns, so a little bit deeper than we, than we think we can, we can use this, this data. Um, and then we've got a little bit of overlap. We start the, uh, the three photon microscopy about 450 microns and then extend it down to, to white matter. And we're going to have to come back and assess, particularly for these deeper locations, whether or not the two photon data is, is, is really usable. <clears throat> so this is the way we've, we've, we've gathered these data sets and, and this mouse has now gone off into the electron micro microscope. Um, one question which often comes up is, is why not simply use three photon microscopy for the, for the whole column? And the short answer is because we didn't have a three photon microscope that was capable of doing that. So the problem we have is that gathering this volume is, is a, it's about 250 fields of view and we have to image each field of view for about an hour. So you think that's 250 hours of imaging. If we image five days a week, two hours a day, that's about 25 weeks or six months of continuous imaging. Right? And we, we don't really expect a mouse to survive um, daily imaging for six months. So in order to make this data set feasible, what we really needed was a multiplane microscope. And we have a multiplane two-photon microscope. We didn't have a multiplane three-photon microscope. <clears throat> so this throws up the question, well, what would it take to build a multiplane three-photon microscope if we wanted to do all of this column with three-photon microscopy? <clears throat> and I think the answer is, is well, Let's, let's look at our two-photon microscope to get the answer. So the way we, we do this with two-photon microscopy is we gather six planes at a time, and six planes take us about 150 milliseconds. So we can gather this volume. We can gather all six planes at about six hertz. In order to do that, we have a, a single frame time of about 22 milliseconds. Obviously, we, we, we acquire this with a, with a resonant galvanometer. And then the focusing time between planes is somewhere in the region of about three milliseconds. And, um, so I guess something nobody's really mentioned very much to date is the, the repetition rate of, of the lasers we mostly use for three-photon microscopy. And it tends to be quite low. One of the sort of the main disadvantages historically of three-photon microscopy has been that the frame rate is, is rather lower than, than is typical for, for two-photon microscopy. So our frame time for, for our three-photon microscope that we were using in that, um, in that column project was 125 milliseconds. <clears throat> so obviously that's, a, that's kind of a very bad starting point for now trying to, to gather uh, multiple frames. So I think if we were to try and gather six frames with this instrument, it would probably take us a little more than a second. So um, not, not a great starting point. So if we really want to do multiplane three-photon imaging, I think the first thing we need is a, is a much shorter frame time, and that means getting back to, to resonant galvanometers. So what would it take to, to get back to resonant galvanometers? Well, I think the short answer is it takes a slightly faster laser, but only a slightly faster laser. So we've, we've routinely used a one megahertz laser. At the time when we bought this laser, that was the fastest laser available. But we're now, there are now four megahertz lasers available. Uh, we have one, actually the, the images look very good. And the good news is that at four megahertz with a, a four kilohertz galvanometer and, and 256 pixels a line, we can now get into this regime where we have at least one pulse per pixel. So I think it's realistic to expect with with some of these newer lasers to be able to use resonance scanning again and to be able to sort of do video rate imaging. Maybe sort of 32 hertz a frame is, is kind of realistic. So with that in mind, then we, we, we need a second thing. We need, we need fast focusing. We need to be able to change our focal planes pretty quickly. And so to try and generate this um, multiplane instrument, we've kind of changed up the format of our microscope a little to include both temporal multiplexing and fast focusing. So we take our, our beam, this is our compressor. We split the beam. We put a delay line on one of the two paths. Um, so this is, this is our temporal multiplexing going on here. We run one of these two beams into a remote focusing unit. So this is going to be the mechanism we use for fast focusing. The sort of the easiest way, obviously, to focus is to move our objective up and down. The big problem, of course, is that objectives are large and heavy, so it's quite hard to move them quickly. <clears throat> so this remote focusing is kind of a neat little trick where you create a a conjugate plane with the specimen here using a second objective 
and then you place a mirror in this conjugate plane. And the mirror, of course, is small and light, so you can move a mirror very quickly. So we can move this, this mirror up and down on the, on the order of a few milliseconds, and as we move this mirror up and down, it shifts a focal plane uh, in the specimen. So this is why it's called remote focusing. We do our focusing up here, and it, it re results in focusing uh, down in the specimen. <clears throat> so we have a, a configuration set up with, um, where we, we create a second beam, essentially doubling our repetition rate, and, um, and then use remote focusing. And this is, seems to work out quite nicely. We can, we can now acquire two images at two different focal planes simultaneously, at very similar powers. And as far as we can tell, these, these two images are essentially equivalent. They're, they're reversible. So the way, oh, yeah, I've got another. Yeah, so, so one obvious question with remote focusing is, is what it does to your point spread function. And in fact, the point spread function looks to be <coughs> very well preserved for focal shifts of up to about 50 microns from the, from the focal plane. So we can, we can, we can image over a, a z-axis distance of about 100 microns without any significant degradation of our image quality, either in the axial or in the lateral direction there. So how do we plan to use this? Well, if we split our beam and we, we focus in four steps, we can generate essentially eight-plane imaging um, at, at a sufficient rate, probably around about five hertz, um, for, the, for the experiments that, that we need to do. So with this sort of instrument, I think we really could have, have gathered the whole column with three photon imaging and not had to sort of make these decisions about when to switch between two and three photon. So it's a nice thought process, but do we plan to do this again? Absolutely not. I think the electron microscopist would probably shoot me if I suggested it. <coughs> but we do plan to, um, to gather a cat column. So, um, so the mouse column is, is as, as I said, largely done, but, um, but you know, for a visual neuroscientist, really a, 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 a full reconstruction of a macaque uh, cortical column would be, I think, the holy grail. Um, in a macaque, of course, this is where free photon really, really um, is of value, right? So the macaque cortex is roughly twice as thick as mouse cortex. It's about 1.6 millimeters deep. Um, Two photon microscopy, well, if we're being generous, it might get us to about 500 microns, right? That's about the top third of a macaque um, cortex. Three photon excitation, we, we sort of expect to be able to get through most, perhaps even all of, of, mouse, of, of macaque cortex. Um, we've just done our, our very first macaque experiments. Unfortunately, we didn't have label all the way down in the, in the deep layers of cortex, so I can't tell you how deep we can image but we could estimate the attenuation length from a CAC and get some sort of ballpark estimates of the sort of power we expect to need at different depths in, in macaque cortex um, to, to, to replicate the signal to noise and characteristics we had for our mouse experiments. And we're, we're reasonably optimistic. We think we can get fairly close to, uh, to the bottom of mouse corte uh, macaque cortex here with, with three photon excitation without, without exceeding 120 milli milliwatts, which is what we... That's a, sort of our, our guesstimate of the likely thermal damage threshold. So, um, so I think we're looking pretty good for macaque, although I don't know if we're going to quite get deep enough with our microscope as it stands. Um, there are, however, a few little upgrades. I won't go into them in great detail, but um, something we have, um, we have done a little bit of is um, adaptive optics, which is a great way to, um, to uh, correct aberrations. And for the sort of the large 400 micron field of view um, that we typically have in our, in our three photon experiments, we can roughly double the, the illumination or the, um, the um, brightness by, uh, by doing aberration correction with adaptive optics. And, and this is adaptive optics with a, with a deformable mirror, so we can, we can switch the correction on and off, which is what you're seeing in this movie here. Um, so this is the correction switching on and off here. So maybe with a few little upgrades, we might be able to extend this depth just a little bit more and perhaps get all the way to the bottom of, of macaque cortex, um, which I'm sure will please the electron microscopist no end. Um, okay, so what have I told you? Well, I've told you a little bit about two-photon microscopy. Um, our two-photon results were certainly reliable to around about 450 microns below the pier, and this was in a very densely labeled mouse. So I, I don't think, this is kind of a worst case scenario for, for two photon imaging. I think what this really tells us is that, is that two photon imaging is gonna be reliable to 450 microns in pretty much any mouse line we could, we could want, to, uh, want to image. 
at deeper locations in, in our densely labeled mouse line, two photon became unreliable, and we really need three photon then to, to measure the tuning properties there. But I think we're in a, sort of a, an unusual situation in using a very densely labeled mouse. And I, I think in, in, um, in more, more uh, sparsely labeled mouse lines, probably there, there's, there's, uh, there's, there's probably a, a deeper depth to which you can image with two photon microscopy and get reliable, reliable results. The bad news is that I'm not sure how you decide uh, to what depth you can reliably image without having a, a comparator, without having something like three photon microscopy to which to compare. So I think beyond 450 microns, uh, just beware. Uh, you, know, you could be in a situation where the two photon uh, imaging is, is perhaps reporting some, some different results. Um, on three photon microscopy then, I think with a four megahertz laser, we really do expect to, to get back into resonance scanning and sort of get over this, uh, this speed disadvantage that, that three photon microscopy has. And I think we should be able to image to, to more than a millimeter under those conditions without exceeding the thermal limit of gray matter. And I'm kind of expecting that with a few very simple upgrades, that should give us enough to be able to image all the way through macaque cortex. Um, <coughs> and perhaps a little beyond, who knows. Okay, so um, thank you all very much for listening. And thank you again, Scientifica, for this, this meeting today.